Hello, my name is Walter Mack, and today we will be discussing basic approach to MRI of the ankle. And so once again, this discussion will be fairly light on pathology and um, more focused on just the mechanics of going through a study and how we go about doing image interpretation. Okay, so in general when I look at an ankle MRI, I basically break the study down into a few major categories. First I look at all the tendons, and then I look at all the ligaments, and then after that then I'll look at the tibotalar joint, subtalar joint, followed by the midfoot articulations, look at the sinus tarsi which we'll talk about, and then I end by looking at the plantar fascia, and then we're into a miscellaneous category after we've hit all the major structures, looking at the intrinsic musculature, uh, marrow signal, looking for incidental findings. Okay, some people may adopt a more regional approach, preferring to look at the medial structures versus lateral structures, then posterior structures, so on and so forth. And I think the, the major thing is that you find an approach that works for you and that you become comfortable with and also one that allows you to ensure that you've gone through a s study systematically without leaving anything out. Okay, so this is just my approach of course there are many ways to skin a cat. So let's start by looking at the tendons and there are of course anterior tendons, lateral tendons, um, deep posterior tendons, and then the Achilles tendon. So why don't we start with the Achilles tendon. And of course that's this big tendon here um, that is basically the confluence of your superficial uh, posterior compartment musculature in the calf. As we can see, like all tendons, it generally has a homogeneous low signal appearance on all sequences. Okay, And really it should have, when you look at this on axial sequences, it should have a concave anterior appearance. This study actually was not technically 100% normal. You're going to appreciate that there's very slight convexity of this anterior surface here. So this was actually called mild tendinosis and I would concur that the normal Achilles tendon should again have a nice smooth concave anterior contour. Uh, for those who like to measure the anterior posterior thickness of the Achilles tendon should really be no more than 7 millimeters. Uh, you may have noticed that there's this wee little guy here off towards the medial aspect of the Achilles tendon. This is simply the plantaris tendon and um, it really serves no useful purpose. I think up to 70% of us are actually walking around without one of these, but you may mistake this for a remnant of the Achilles tendon in the setting of a, a complete Achilles rupture. Okay, so if we see increased signal within the tendon but not fluid signal as we see here then we might be apt to call this tendinosis. If we see um, fluid signal defects then we're going to start talking about partial thickness tears and of course if the whole tendon is disrupted that's a complete tear. It's important to note where the uh, tear is. Is it near the muscular tendon's junction? Is it mid-substance? Is it at the insertion? And once again, if it's a partial tear, I find it helpful to give an approximate cross-sectional area of involvement because that tends to be a, lends itself to a very intuitive understanding uh, for the reader. Um, there is a bursa in the retrocalcaneal region. This is the retrocalcaneal bursa. There is also a superficial or retro Achilles bursa, and as you can see in this case here, there is a drop of fluid, so we might call mild retrocalcaneal bursitis in this case. Okay, uh, it is helpful also to look at the morphology of the top of the calcaneal tuberosity. If there is a prominent bump here that has been referred to as a Hagelin deformity, and may be seen in the triad of findings of Achilles insertional tendinosis, retrocalcaneal bursitis, as well as retroachilles bursitis. Okay, let's now look at the deep posterior tendons, okay, and those include the tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor hallucis longus tendons. So how do we remember the order of these tendons? We use the nom mnemonic uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry, and actually, uh, we can actually lengthen that mnemonic further and say Tom, Dick, and very nervous, Harry, the and very nervous corresponding to the tibial neurovascular bundle. 
And so in general, we would use the axial sequence to look at these tendons. And like other tendons, they should be homogeneous low signal. It's important to become comfortable with the relative sizes of these tendons. You'll note that the tibialis posterior here is bigger than flexor digitorum longus, and that's normal. It really should be twice as big as flexor digitorum longus in the normal situation. If it's the same size and this is too small, we would suggest a partial thickness tear of the PTT. If it's four or five, six times as big, then that's too big, and we would suggest tendinosis. Okay. As you know, the tibialis posterior is going to insert on mainly the uh, medial aspect of the navicular and parenthetically there are more distal insertions to the uh, cuneiforms and metatarsal bases but I think for now we should just concentrate on the main attachment at the medial navicular and you'll see this little pebble here this is actually an accessory navicular it's a type 1 accessory navicular and the type 1 accessory navicular generally doesn't have too much clinical import however it might make the tendon look bigger so before you call insertional tendinosis of tubulus posterior make sure that there's not a type 1 accessory osco that's causing this uh, tendon to look big all right. As you may or may not know, a type 2 accessory navicular is one where instead of a pebble, you actually have a, a nice sizable fragment that forms a synchondrosis with the navicular. And that um, kind of pseudo-articulation, if you will, may be a pain generator. So that's potentially clinical significant. And the type 3 accessory navicular, uh, the so-called cornuate navicular, is one where instead of having a separate fragment, you actually have an elongated navicular bone that's comma shaped hence the term cornuate all right um, and then so here's flexor digitorum longus flexor halsus longus again you may see uh, fluid around the flexor halsus longus in the normal situation and it's important to recall or note that in at least 20 percent of cases the flexor halsus longus tendon sheath shown here communicates with the joint so seeing fluid in the flexor house as long as tendon sheath in and of itself does not necessarily represent a pathologic state. Uh, the flexor house is longest posterior to the talus kind of um, insinuates through this groove formed between the lateral and medial tubercles of the posterior uh, Taylor process and this regional anatomy will be important again when we looked at the posterior talar fibular ligament in those patients who have an os trigonum uh, then you will see that os trigonum form a synchondrosis with the lateral tubercle of the posterior talar process all right and a favorite OSCE question involves the course of the flexor house as long as slightly more distally this is here the Sestum Tacklum Tali of the medial calcaneus, and it's a great landmark for flexor halsus longus as that tendon courses beneath the Sestum Tacklum Tali. Uh, unfortunately, once these tendons kind of curve around the midfoot, then you really need to move off the axial sequence to see the tendons uh, properly. Uh, so, for example, here once again is our Sestum Tacklum Tali, and here is flexor halsus longus flexor digitorum longus tibialis posterior. Okay, So once again, um, if we see heterogeneous signal, we might query tendinosis. If we see uh, attenuated appearance or high signal within the tendons, then we're going to start talking about partial or full thickness tears. Um, if you look very, very closely, the uh, this is the tibial nerve. And very early on, it's going to split up into two components. The more uh, anteriorly positioned medial plantar branch and the more posteriorly positioned lateral plantar branch. And just be aware that this whole enclosed space here, this is the uh, flexor retinaculum. Okay, uh, we have the lateral borders being the talus and calcaneus and more inferiorly the abductor hallucis. All these structures are basically defining this tightly confined space known as the tarsal tunnel. You can imagine if we have uh, ganglia, uh, varices, uh, solid masses in this tightly confined space, we may see compression of the tibial nerve and this would give rise to potential tarsal tunnel syndrome. Okay, let's move on to the uh, lateral ankle tendons and so we're mainly uh, focused on the pronus brevis and longus. Here's the pronus brevis muscle and here's the pronus brevis tendon. 
uh, brevis bone, closer to bone, that's one way to remember that it's the brevis here. And the longest generally is more superficial. And we should be able to resolve two discrete tendons. Note that the tendons are directly posterior to the lateral malleolus, okay? So if they're even shifted off to the side here like that, that's too, too far lateral and we would um, call subluxation of the perineal tendons, okay? And sometimes it can be hard uh, to follow these because they're in such close uh, proximity to one another. You just have to be very diligent about following them. As you know, the pronus brevis inserts onto the base of the metatarsal, okay, and the pronus longus is going to curve under the cuboid en route to its insertions at the medocuneiform base of first metatarsal. And so if we're looking on a chrono, uh, if we just remember that the pronus brevis is going to insert higher up, then we can remember that it is the uh, more superior tendon as compared to pronus longus and ditto for your uh, appearance on the sagittal images. So once again, this is pronus brevis, this is pronus longus. Note how there's this kind of osseous fragment here next to the cuboid. You remember from your plane from analysis that this corresponds to the os pronium and it is within the substance as shown here, uh, the pronus longus tendon. Let's talk about pronus longus tendon first. So there are three specific locations where you are apt to see pathology of pronus longus and they relate to the three um, turns of the pronus longus tendon. So uh, where it curves under the lateral malleolus you might see tendinosis or tearing and then more distally uh, sometimes it will abrade against this bony protuberance known as the perineotubercle. Alright, so there may be some attritional changes uh, seen in that location. And finally where the pernus longus curves under the cuboid, there may be um, propensity for developing tears and tendinosis in that location. And because of the the propensity for pathology in this location, it's important that you do follow the pernus longus um, on your sagittal or coronal in addition to the axial to make sure that you assess all of that pernus longus. All right. Now let's go back to perineus brevis and uh, it doesn't go nearly as far so I think most of the time we can get away with looking at it on just the axial. And so once again if it's heterogeneous in signal or slightly increased but not fluid signal um, in uh, character then we would call tendinosis. If, it's f if we see fluid signal then we would call tear. And uh, commonly encountered tear in this location is a split tear of pronus brevis and how that would look on on an MRI is you would actually see two sub tendons okay um, and so you'd see longest and then you see one little tendon here and one little tendon there um, kind of giving you like a Mickey Mouse sign or a uh, not a TIE fighter sign but but the other ship in the Star Wars movie um, and so that would that would be a good look for a pronus brevis split tear okay Notice this thin band here. This is the superior perineal retinaculum. Uh, you may recall um, that plane film appearance of a fleck fracture off the distal fibula, not quite at the lateral myelialis. That is basically an evulsion fracture of the superior perineal retinaculum. You might see thickening of the SPR. Uh, and if you see those sorts of changes, once again, you should try to look for perineal tendon subluxation. All right, okay. The anterior ankle tendons don't get much press because they don't, there's not usually as much pathology as he'll say with them. I use the mnemonic Tom Hate Stick to remember the order of these tendons. Uh, tibialis anterior, okay, extensor hallucis, and extensor digit form. In truth, there's actually a fourth tendon if you look really, really carefully. It's the pronius tertius. All right, and not to be confused with pronus cortis, which is a normal variant accessory muscle slash tendon that you may see back here with the other perineal tendons. Um, you might see an MR requisition that actually says focal mass anterior ankle, and that's actually a fairly typical story for a uh, anterior tendon injury, chronic um, of either a tibialis anterior or one of these other tendons. So you might, for example, see a um, uh, a transected tendon and maybe some heterotopic ossification or some fluid and tendon sheath or something like that. So before you call mass, just um, ensure that you're not actually doing an, either an acute or a chronic tendon injury. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about the ankle ligaments. And there's a whole bunch and I think um, 
when you first start out, it, it can be quite daunting, but in, in many respects, the ankle MR is actually quite easy because it's a long checklist, but as you check through the different components, you're going to find that the assessment actually goes by pretty quickly. So let's start with, we're going to use, once again, our axial, it's our workhorse sequence for, for uh, the ligaments. And let's start with the syndesmotic ligaments. And we assess the syndesmotic ligaments at the level where you see the tuba plafond, okay? And so at this level, you're going to see anteriorly the anterior inferior tib fib ligament as well as the posterior inferior tib fib ligament. And once again, these are the syndesmotic ligaments. If you're going to diagnose a syndesmotic injury, you're going to look for disruption of these ligaments, widening of the syndesmosis on your fluid sensitive sequence as shown here. You may see abnormal high signal tracking up the distal tubofilus syndesmosis. And while I have the chronus sequence up, I just want to point out that the anterior inferior tib fib ligaments are often quite nicely seen on your chrono. You should see two discrete fascicles. Here I, I see the inferior fascicle quite nicely, the more superior fascicle admittedly not well shown on this study. You should see two discrete fascicles. If you see one, you should wonder if there has been a previous partial injury of the anterior inferior tib fib ligament. Let's just stick on the chrono for a second and scroll slightly more posteriorly. And as we scroll posteriorly, you're going to see a whole host of ligaments. There's going to be the posterior inferior tib fib ligament, the transverse tib fibular ligament, there's something called the tibial slip, and then we're going to work our way all the way down to the posterior talofibular fibular ligament. I don't think it's important to remember all of those individual structures. The reason why I point that out is because if we're not careful and we're just haphazardly scrolling across on our sagittal sequence, what can happen if we're not careful is we might mistake one of these ligaments for an intraticular loose body within the tibitalar joint. And I think we can avoid this pitfall simply by scrolling back and forth and recognizing the linearity of the low signal focus that we're seeing on sagittal and understand that it is in fact one of these ligamentous structures that we were referring to back here. So to recap, at the level of the tibial plafond, we are assessing the syndesmotic ligaments, anterior inferior tib fib ligament, interosseous ligament, and posterior inferior tib fib ligament. Okay, if we scroll slightly more inferiorly, at the level where the lateral malleolus is concave, this is the level at which we assess the lateral ankle ligaments. And those include the anterior talofibular ligament, uh, the calcaneofibular ligament, and the posterior talofibular ligament. All right, so let's uh, tackle these one at a time. So the anterior talofibular ligament is this structure here, and as you can see, it attaches to the lateral talus. And I think assessing this ligament can sometimes be challenging because most people are able to find it, but then the question is, is it too thick or is it too thin? And so what someone to encouraged me to do a long, long time ago was to actually use the uh, sagittal to look for this ligament. And at first I thought he was crazy, but then over time, I looked and looked, and the more I looked, the more I found, yes, it's really helpful. And let me, let me show you why I think it's helpful. Okay. So for starters, you um, may have trouble seeing the ATFL in the axial plane depending on the position of the ankle. Uh, at the time of scanning, for example, if it's in the plantar flex position, you may not actually see the ATFL on a single axial image. Um, I also find that the sagittal is helpful because it allows me to use the PTFL as a nice internal control and then I can then gauge whether or not the caliber of the ATFL is normal for this patient. So let's just go through this exercise now. This is a far lateral sagittal image showing the lateral malleolus and I'm just going to scroll back and forth like so. And I think as I scroll back and forth, one can readily see the anterior fibular, anterior talofibular fibular ligament kind of moving off anteriorly towards the talus. And here's the posterior talofibular ligament kind of moving posteriorly to attach to that lateral tubercle of the posterior process of the talus. And as we scroll back and forth, then I think we can appreciate that in this case, the ATFL and PTFL are roughly similar caliber. And I think that makes me very comfortable that we're dealing with an intact um, ATFL. The axial does show the posterior talofibular ligament quite nicely as well. And this is yet another one of these structures that we have to accept a strided appearance and subtle increased signal as being normal. So don't ever call posterior talofibular ligament injury on the basis of increased signal because it normally does have uh, intermediate increased signal, much like what we saw with the ACL in the knee. And typically, 
um, you'll see a t uh, sorry posterior tail fibula ligament injury in the setting of high velocity, high energy trauma, i.e. those those patients and cases that generally don't subsequently go on to MRI. So in your routine kind of ambulatory patient coming in for an ankle MRI, very unusual to see a, a PTFL injury. Not impossible, of course, but um, the bulk of your MRs will not show a PTFL injury. But um, you know, we, we do occasionally scan high, high energy, high trauma patients, so it, it is always something to consider. So I've left out the, the, the middle one of these um, lateral ligaments, and that's a calcaneal ligament. That one's a little trickier to find, and I find that it's best to kind of work backwards and go from the calcaneal attachment and then work your way um, more superiorly to the fibular attachment. So this is a more inferior image of the ankle, and this is the lateral calcaneus, and it's this little guy here. This is the calcaneal attachment of the calcaneal fibular ligament. And now I'm going to slowly scroll superiorly, and you're going to see that this little guy kind of ducks in front of the perineal tendons, and then it's going to attach to the lateral malleus. So it's this guy right in here. And I find in my experience that it's a structure that you really have to work at to find and I you'll see cases where this thing is just sticking out at you like a sore thumb in those cases I'm actually suspicious that it's too thick I feel like I shouldn't have to work at it to find this ligament if it's just sticking out at me uh, without me making any effort to find it then gen generally I'm gonna call it too thick and I'm gonna query an old sprain um, or partial thickness injury Okay, and so now let's just try to find this calcaneofibular ligament on the chrono sequence. We're going to kind of scroll posteriorly. It's actually this guy here. Here's our calcaneus, all right, calcaneus. Here's our calcaneo attachment, and now I'm going to slowly scroll anteriorly, and it's going to just going to duck in front of those perineal tendons, and then attach to the. Um, lateral malleolus as you can see there. So in general these these lateral ankle ligaments are going to tear from anterior to posterior so you would tear your ATFL first or you would sprain it. Okay so once again uh, you see a tear is it partial thickness, is it full thickness, is it just a sprain and then next you'll tear your CFL and then finally and less commonly your PTFL. It's not entirely impossible to have an isolated calcaneal fibular ligament tear that's been described and I've seen that it's just less common all right so once again at the lateral of the lateral the level of the lateral malleus that's where we assess our lateral ankle ligaments let's turn our attention to the medial aspect of the ankle all right and now we're going to look at the superficial and deep fibers of the deltoid ligament in your reading you will probably have encountered that there are actually a whole host of different components both to the deep and superficial deltoid ligaments and for most MR interpretations I don't think it's important to go through each individual component and generally we would just kind of read them as a, an aggregate of, of structures. So I find that uh, visualization of the deep deltoid ligament is is quite possible in all sequences. So what I do on axials I find the medial malleolus and then maybe I scroll in fear one or two images Okay, so one image in this case, and you're going to see a nice striated appearance of the deep deltoid ligament with both anterior and posterior tibial tailor components. So this is a nice sagittal view of it. I think a lot of people, and myself included, we're going to use actually the chrono to assess it. Once again, you see nice striated fibers. If you see the fibers but they're heterogeneous, then once again we're uh, querying sprains. Um, you might see cases where there actually f is fluid signal defect running through the uh, ligament, in which case we can call partial tears, and try to look carefully on your non-fat saturated sequence, because occasionally you're also going to see small osseous fragments, and that can be a clue of an old deltoid ligament evolution, and that can be hard to pick up on your fat saturated sequences. So here's your deep deltoid ligament. The superficial deltoid ligament is actually made of multiple components as well, um, including anterior and posterior tip tailor components, uh, tip tibial calcaneal component, uh, tibial navicular component, so on and so forth. And these are actually contiguous with the thin flexor retinaculum that you see here. So this is kind of the superficial deltoid here. One component that I think is worthwhile assessing individually 
is this uh, tibial spring component. So let's look on this crone here. This guy running across, and you can see that it becomes contiguous with this other structure that's seemingly cradling the tailor head. So this structure cradling the tailor head is a spring ligament, which we're going to talk about momentarily. Um, and then this part of it up here is the tibial spring component, right? So when you're assessing for damage to these ligaments, I find it's helpful to go onto your chrono, um, both your, your non-fat saturated sequence to look at the anatomy quite nicely, and your uh, PD fat sat or your T2 fat sat to look for anatomy. So you would actually look for high signal in this location and disruption of lig ligament. I think this is just a trace of uh, joint fluid here and not to be mistaken for tears of either. Okay, so I had mentioned in passing the spring ligament. Now we're going to delve into the three components of the spring ligament. And the anatomist will talk about three different components, but an old foot colleague of mine would say to me, you know, Walter, I go in there with my scope and really it's just one contiguous web of ligaments. So um, I don't think it's terribly important to assess each individual component, but I would say that there is more importance given to this component here. This is the supramedial oblique component and it runs from the sustentaculum tali posteriorly and it's going to insert onto the medial navicular just deep to the tibialis posterior tendon. All right, so how we find it on axial is we basically scroll until we find the sustentaculum tali and it's then going to be this thick band here. So remember this is PTT and this band deep to it is actually the superior medial oblique portion of the spring ligament. All right. And so in general, as, as is the rule here as well, the ligaments are deep to tendons. And so that's, if you remember that, then it gets hard, easier to sort of which is which here. And if we try to find it on chrono, um, once again, we look for the sustum tacular tali. Here it is. And now I'm just going to scroll anteriorly. And it's going to be this ligament structure that's seemingly coming out of the screen and making a beeline for the superior medial oblique portion of the navicular. So it's going to be in here. And you would go onto your fluid sensitive fat saturated sequence and look for a fluid signal in this location to um, diagnose a spring ligament tear. In passing, I just want to mention the intermediate or medial plantar um, component of the spring ligament and then more inferiorly in lateral the infraplantar or lateral band of the spring ligament. These are less important. I want you to focus on the superior medial oblique portion, which by the way is also nicely seen on ultrasound. You kind of put your probe down here. You can see PTT, flexor digital longus, and then a nice fibrillar structure corresponding to the superior medial oblique portion of the spring ligament. Okay, so when you see a um, tibialis posterior tendon tear or tibialis posterior tendinosis, then you should immediately assess A, the lateral weight-bearing plane film of this patient, um, because often patients with tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction will have a flat foot, and also the supramedial oblique portion of the spring ligament. Because imagine if you have tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction and damage, basically this is a major inverter of the um, ankle and foot and so if you lose that every time you toe off basically your tailor head is digging into this spring ligament here and over time you're going to suffer attritional changes and once this tears then you've lost a ligament to support the tailor head and then you get your flat foot okay so all these findings can actually be related in the entity known as tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction okay great so just a little further distally, we don't usually do an ankle MRI to assess the Lis Frank ligament, but you know, depending on the availability or lack of clinical correlation and good history, who knows? It's in, it's not inconceivable that you may actually be looking at a Lis Frank injury. So I actually have that on my checklist just to make sure I don't get burned that way. So as you know, the major um, interosseous component of the Lis Frank ligament runs from the lateral distal aspect of the medial cuneiform, and it's going to insert onto the second metatarsal base along that medial base right there. Okay, we see it nicely here. And you can also occasionally see the Lis Frank ligament nicely on chrono if you go far enough. In this case, we didn't go far enough, so you can't see it here. 
Uh, some people use the sagittal to look at the spring ligament, and I think it's okay to just get a, a general look at the ligament, but it gets hard to for me to be confident knowing what component of the spring ligament I'm looking at if I use the sagittal. So if I do look at it on the sagittal, it's supplementary and um, uh, a supplement to what information I gleaned from the axial and chrono sequences. All right. So those are so we've done all the tendons and we've done all the ligaments and that's actually a huge chunk of the checklist. Now we're going to focus our attention to the Taylor dome and tibiotibular joint. So as you may recall, the uh, talus has a funny kind of morphology. It's actually wider anteriorly than posteriorly. And why is this potentially important? Um, it's potentially important because you might actually find an image like so or an image like way out here where it just looks really irregular in the region of the Taylor dome and there may be overwhelming temptation to call osteochondral lesion or osteochondral injury of the Taylor dome. Uh, just make sure that before you do so that you correlate with the chronal and make sure that you're actually um, looking at a, an image that is cutting through the Taylor dome itself. All right, um, And so that, that is usually easily avoided. A common indication for ankle MR is to look for osteochondral injury or osteochondral lesion of the Taylor dome. And basically you assess this joint just like any other joint uh, that we looked at, for example, in the knee. Once again, as we saw in the knee, uh, cartilage is going to have this kind of intermediate signal on all sequences, not quite the signal of fluid, but generally more um, hyperintense compared to the subchondral bone plate and more hyperintense to fat saturated yellow marrow on your fluid sensitive sequence. If we do see a lesion then of course we should give a measurement of the lesion in two dimensions and we should look for MR findings of instability. Um, is there fluid signal tracking between the lesion and the parent bone? Are there cysts at the interface between the lesion and the parent bone? Is the fragment frankly dislocated? If not frankly dislocated, is there a, is there a focal break in the subchondral bone plate? And a question I often get asked is, well, when do I call it OCD and when do I just call it OA? And I think a lot of it has to do with acuity, clinical context, and whether we're dealing with a focal um, abnormality in an otherwise pristine looking tibotalar joint, or if we're dealing with wholesale chondral loss everywhere with cysts everywhere, osteophytes, so on and so forth. The latter situation, of course, more in keeping with osteoarthritis. And I, when I look at these, I always try to um, put my myself in the shoes of the clinician. If I were to treat this, would I be looking at joint centric therapy? Uh, so steroid injections, kind of activity modification, footwear, ultimately fusion and or, or um, arthroplasty? Or would I be considering lesion specific therapies such as um, uh, autologous uh, osteochondral transfer, um, allograft transfer, primary ORIF of an OCD, uh, chondrocyte implantation, you know, fancy things like that. Okay, so I find that um, putting yourself in the correct clinical context is helpful. Uh, with regards to the cartilage itself, once again, remember that the very deepest layer is actually quite dark, so not all of this is bone, just like we talked about in the knee. And you, once again, you assess the cartilage the same way. You see signal heterogeneity um, without an actual defect or thinning, then I might call, you know, grade one or mild chondrosis. Once I start seeing thinning, then I'm going to talk about moderate chondrosis, either folk or diffuse. And then when we see secondary bone changes, either marrow, edema, or cyst formation, then we're talking about severe chondrosis, again, focal or diffuse. Okay. You might find it's harder to assess cartilage in the tibiotalar joint compared to, say, the patellofemoral articulation, simply because the cartilage is generally thinner. But uh, with practice, you'll find that you, you'll get quite comfortable. Uh, if you do see an OCD, sometimes the axial gives you a nice perspective too as, as to how big it is or how, how extensive it is as well. So that may help in an, as in an adjunctive sort of way. All right. So we've done all the tendons, we've done all the ligaments, we've done the tubotalar joint and glintalar dome. And I find that a very economical way to get through the remainder of the joints is to pull up the sagittals because those, those sagittal images will cut through the remaining hind foot and midfoot articulations in cross sections. So in one fell swoop, you get a look at the posterior subtalar joint, the transverse tarsal joints are show part joints, uh, calcinocuboid joint here, tail and navicular joint here, uh, navicular cuneiform joints, so the navicular to the medial and intermediate and lateral cuneiform joints, 
there's a bit of edema here so we might actually query some chondrosis here and then the trastamatarsal joint so here's the cuboid so here is five four three three two and one trastamatarsal joints and so just a couple of scrolls back and forth and you can assess all the midfoot articulations quite easily okay so now we've done all the tendons we've done all the ligaments we've done the tailor dome to the tailor joint and we've looked at all the the other joints as well <coughs> now let's spend a couple of minutes talking about the sinus tarsi the sinus tarsi is this cone shaped fat um, filled space with the base of the cone pointed laterally the apex pointing medially and we can see it quite nicely on all sequences here and it contains multiple components including uh, the roots of the inferior extensor retinaculum um, the intrasious ligament cervical ligament once again not critical to know about all these individual ligamentous structures basically what we're trying to do is assess whether or not there's at least some preservation of fat signal within this space okay as we can see here there are those ligaments components but then the rest of this is fat signal all sequences um, if you see partial effacement of that sinus tarsi fat then usually it's indicative of local extension of a process originating elsewhere and it would not necessarily invoke sinus tarsi syndrome however if you see a case where all this fat is completely effaced and you see either homogeneous low signal or homogeneous fluid signal on your fluid sensitive sequence then we can start suggesting that there may be uh, a sinus tarsi syndrome going on here and that's the clinical syndrome of subjective hind foot instability usually sequelae of disruption of these ligamentous structures. If you see low signal throughout on all sequences that suggests a more chronic process. If you see fluid signal throughout then that suggests a more subacute to acute process and once again we want to see complete effacement of that sinus tarsi fat before we invoke sinus tarsi syndrome. Okay so we've done the tendons, ligaments, tibetalar joint, tailor dome, other joints, sinus tarsi. Let's spend a moment or two talking about plantar fascia. All right, and I, I really like using the chrono and sagittals together to assess the plantar fascia. The chrono is quite nice because it actually lets you see the three different components of the plantar fascia. Okay, so you have your medial cord, central cord, lateral cord. Okay, the lateral cord comes off the lateral tubercle. Uh, central cord comes off that lateral tubercle. The medial cord actually comes off the central cord here. Uh, some clinicians may actually consider this the medial cord and then just have a lateral cord as well so there is you're going to encounter that inconsistency in the literature as well but for now let's just call this the medial cord central cord and uh, lateral oh actually I've got this mixed up so this is the medial cord this is the uh, central cord this is the lateral cord here is the lateral malleolus of course okay so once again the medial cord comes off the central cord central cord comes off the medial tubercle the lateral cord comes off the lateral tubercle here all right and so when we're assessing for plantar fasciitis one of the questions is well how how thick is too thick right so I've always been coached to use a measurement of four millimeters by fun I'm probably going to overcall a lot of plantar fasciitis so increasingly I'm just looking subjectively um, is this too thick? Is it heterogeneous in appearance? And if so, then I may start calling some plantar fasciitis. Uh, you might actually see plantar fascial tears if you see fluid signal and actual disruption of fibers. And in recalcitrant cases, you might actually see reactive edema in the calcaneus as well. Um, occasionally, you're going to see focal thickening of the plantar fascia, but it's not going to be right at the calcaneal insertion. It's going to be slightly more distally in the region of the midfoot. In those situations, you should wonder if you're actually dealing with a plantar fibroma, okay, superficial fibromatosis. And the classic location is going to be along the medial margin, central cord, plantar fascia in the midfoot region. And not uncommonly, these are actually multiple, so you might see two little bumps. And unless you're alerted to it on the requisition, they can be quite easy to walk over. So notice how, in this case, this normal plantar fascia has a very smooth contour. A plantar fibroma may just shows a very raised subtle superficial bump here okay uh, usually it's if, if they work in the MR for that purpose they would tell you and probably the MR tech would have put a marker indicating that there's a palpable bump there that the patient can report okay so we've looked at the tendons we've looked at the ligaments 
We've looked at the tibial tailor joint, tailor dome, other joints, sinus tarsi, plantar fascia, and that's pretty much it. So before we finalize the report and go on to the next case, this is where we kind of look at miscellaneous things. We're going to look at regional musculature. We're going to look at marrow signal. We're going to make sure that there are no soft tissue or bone lesions. We're going to make sure that there are no um, joint diffusions in either the tibial tailor joint, sub tailor joint, or any of the other joints for that matter, or ganglion cysts arising from any of these joints. Um, the chrono allows us to look further. We talked briefly early on about the medial and lateral plantar branches of the tibial nerve and on your chrono you can actually follow those out into the midfoot. And once again with time you will gradually learn all of these muscles. <clears throat> There's a lot of them. There's actually four layers of intrinsic foot musculature and I'll be honest with you I often have to consult an atlas when we're dealing with a case where I need to know about the individual muscles here as well. So I think as you're starting out looking at ankle MRI that's a nice to have but not necessary um, piece of information that you'll gradually accumulate. Okay so that's the basic approach to ankle MR. I think once again the key is just looking at a lot of cases, getting used to what's normal, what's within the realm of normal, what's abnormal. So I hope this has been helpful. Thank you for your attention.